My name is Jasmine, and I'm an ex-physicist, a uh, game play engineer, and a current professor at NYU's ITP in their Tisch program. And I'm going to discuss with you today how game development and virtual worlds have led me to think about the human condition. So if I were a character in a game, these would be my play stats. So I have my name, my alias, my occupation, which I like to call digital alchemy, my zodiac sign, and my alias. But these aliases look very different depending on different profiles. For example, as you would notice, these fields like name, occupation, alias, and zodiac sign are also prevalent on social media platforms and on dating profiles. And so we see that gaming profile statistics and fields have actually carried over into social media today. And so that will lead me to saying that there's a common misconception about gamers. And one of them is that they don't know how to interact with people, which may or may not be true, um, and that they use digital avatars as a substitution for human-to-human -human interaction. And there's been a lot of scare about gaming inciting violence, promoting hedonism, and people enacting out power play fantasies. But realistically, there are different archetypes of gamers, just like there are different ways that I portray myself. For instance, on LinkedIn, I pretend to be professional. On Instagram, I take 34 photos of myself just to find that one that looks good enough to where you would wish that you were living my life. Um, <laughs> when I'm on Twitter, I, I give my stream of conscious thought. And when I'm on Tumblr, I reveal my creativity and anxiety in a very well-curated fashion. <laughs> and so there have been numerous gaming psychology models, but one of them has remained prevalent throughout the last few decades. And it's called the Bartle model. And so there are four different types killers, achievers, socializers, and explorers. And I want to preface that if you tend to fit within the killer category, don't worry, there's an alternative name for it called artisan. So don't be put <laughs> off by it. <laughs> and so killers, killers aim to act on the world and to change the world and players. Achievers or guardians seek to you know, play by the world's rules to attain achievements. Socializers or idealists seek to form intricate connections with others, and explorers are wondering what are the intricate processes which compose the world that they're in. And so I say this because, as you notice, those gamer types actually have clear parallels to Enneagram types, to Myers-Briggs types, but I wanted to say that because there are different types of games and we all actually engage in them. So there are party games, tabletop games, video games, we all play them. Whether it's Cards Against Humanity, drinking games at the political debates, um, backgammon, foosball, we all play games. And so I hadn't had any sort of formal game training until, ga game theory tra training until probably two years ago at MIT in the Comparative Media Studies Department. And so one thing that I found myself doing is I was hesitant to talk about my personal narrative or my life story. And so the professor encouraged me to encouraged me to formulate my own narrative and formulate a game to sort of explain how I see the world. And the way that I did that was making a card game that I called Parody. And so on Parody, there are three different, there are three different cards. So the first card, and these, there's a mix of these cards, but a first, the first card represents the avatar or an identity. The second one represents an occupation. And the third one represents a significant life event. And as you would notice, these are things that we tell each other in our live narratives. And this is what makes us us is who we are, what we do, and the events that culminate our lives. And so through this, I was actually able to understand the reason why I cared most about identity was because I feel just being in the physicality that I have, a lot of people have different expectations of me than I have of myself, but I was also able to appreciate the way that my life has introduced me to certain characters or players, has also unfortunately introduced me to NPCs or non-player characters, which have come in at certain times that have taught me lessons. And so I wanted to know if I could extract this outward to see if life itself is a game. And the way that I view life is I do think it's a game, and I think that we all have our own rules and our own set of dictations of how life is. And you know, you could be the hero in someone's uh, game or the anti-hero in someone else's game. But ultimately, I do view life as a game when you look at granular instances in life. And so what I, coming from a physics background, the closest I had to doing game design was simulation. So this right now is an oil-water simulation. 
But I mean, even just looking at that, it actually reminded me of proxemics models I would see. So proxemics is how close and far people need to be. So in the US, we're kind of in the middle. We kind of like to be next to each other, but not really. Whereas in some countries like Finland, I mean, if you go to a bus stop, people are like <laughs> at least two feet away from each other. If anyone's Finnish, I think it's great. <laughs> but <laughs> it's just different, different cultural precedents. And so what I found is that I think the computer graphics over the past 60 or so years has just been a testament of humans and our condition and how we're seeking to get to something, which I will explain later. And so it's amazing that even just in the 1960s, Ivan Sutherland at MIT was able to do Sketchpad, which was the first uh, graphical user interface program, and then was able to also make the sort of Damocles. And if people don't know what that is, that's actually the first virtual reality experience that he made with Bob Sproul, who's now um, an adjunct, or an adjunct lecturer at UMass Amherst. And from that, like there are a lot of other paramount things in computer graphics. So there, were, there was Pong, then after Pong, there was Toy Story. So Toy Story was actually a pretty big deal. I know a lot of us millennials may just see it as a, uh, an instance of nostalgia, but Toy Story was a huge breakthrough in computer graphics. And in 2009, Avatar was released. And after Avatar, in 2014, 2013, Oculus released the DK1, the Development Kit 1 headset, which brought virtual reality to the masses. And in 2016, we have virtual influencers. And this has been a huge debate and discussion, um, if you've been online recently, about how these, how these reveal who we are as humans, how are they going to integrate in our society, should we see them as humans. There's been a lot of ethical debate, you know, a lot of business talk surrounding these virtual beings. But instead of choosing to see something as cynical, I want to choose to create these beings myself to learn the process of creating. And so I actually have, for the past year and a half, tried to develop these virtual avatars. And to be very transparent, we're not at a stage where these avatars are completely autonomous agents. We're not there yet. We're at the point where we use game engines, typically Unity or Unreal, to composite all of the graphics and to try to you know, render each of the pieces individually. And sometimes that has to be overlaid with Photoshop. And so don't worry, we're not close to anything that you've seen in Blade Runner, not yet. Even though Blade Runner was set in November 2019. It was. <laughs> so the way that I actually like to look at this to make it seem less blasphemous, because people think that this endeavor is trying to play God, is that I look at the Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo's creation of Adam. So the creation of Adam is one of the most prolific and beautiful paintings in the world, and it's also cited in a lot of transhumanist literature and transhumanist uh, shows, and if you don't know what transhumanism is, I can explain it, but that's another talk, but basically it's fusing technology with our humanity to create um, a more evolved and advanced species that, that is inclusive and is more, more like profound and more conscious. And so the way that I like to see this is that this isn't inconsistent with, with anyone, whether you are religious, agnostic, or atheist, this all fits within the same framework because the very name Adam actually means of the earth. And so we are creations and we create. And Adam, there's a clear parallel that, that's in, it's both in Buddhist texts and it's in Abrahamic religions where from dust we are to dust we shall return. But what's very interesting to me about tying this thread of dust and this is just me going to go on a train of thought, so stay with me. Please stay with me, this one. So, I think it's interesting because we are composed of dust, and that has been proven in 2014. Most of the elements that comprise us, because helium, you know, makes hydrogen, makes helium, and, and supernovas create other elements, and these elements are found within our body. And so we have stardust in us. So if you want to go home tonight, you can say you're a star, and it's great. Or if you want to go to the creators of Minecraft, you can tell them to make a functionality that allows you to make humans from sand. But either way. <laughs> so from, from this dust, we're actually able to create technology as well, AI. Because dust and the crust is very prevalent on the earth, correct? It's at least 30%. And from this crust, we're able to get minerals. And from those minerals, we extract silica. And from silica, what we do is we purify these to a monocrystalline solid to make pure silicon. Then we 
we thinly slice these into wafers. And after we thinly slice them into wafers, we place photoresist on them, we place a substrate on them, we add lithography to them, and that gives you modern day electronics. So I think it's interesting that we are from dust and we make technology from dust as well. So I, I think that people aren't actually afraid of these virtual agents. So I don't think people are actually afraid of AI. I think that people are actually afraid of other humans <laughs> because we're imbuing these creations or these intended creations with the traits that we have. And so we already do this, and I think gamers get a lot of flack for it, but we all participate in a narrative of presenting ourselves as avatars. And so as we all know, I didn't want to put anyone, you know, I didn't want to blast anyone's picture that I don't know <laughs> on a screen, but we've all seen people use digital face filters to look like dogs, robots, bunnies, other intricate creatures. And so we already use this because we know that by using these digital face filters, our photos actually get 40% more likes. So despite us saying that we don't like things that are falsified and inorganic, we actually tend to have a propensity towards that. And this I found a few days ago. Because of integrity standards on Amazon, this is now taken down. But this just proved the fact that a lot of a lot of who we are is what we try to appear to be, even to the extent where someone, genius, someone thought to make a lens sticker that you could put over your iPhone 10 to make it look like you have an iPhone 11. And to me, <laughs> that is the pinnacle of what Instagram and a lot of these social media networks are, is me pretending to be better than I am or more something than I am instead of, instead of just accepting who I am as a person. And you know what? Maybe I can just wait till the next iteration of the iPhone, but I'm so focused with integrating into a certain societal structure and to make myself seem, you know, I'm in a competitive mind, mindset where I need to have the newest device, and that's not necessarily true. And so one thing that drives us, the reason why we want to compete with others, not all of us, but the killers and artisans do. <laughs> but the reasons why we want to compete with each other, we want to feel good about ourselves, is because despite what everyone tells you, humans are not logical. I don't know who says that, but when people say that, they say that out of advantage, not out, out of conviction. So humans are primarily emotional beings, always have been, and our decisions are primarily emotionally driven. And so the way that I'm looking at this now, now that I have my body or my shell, I would like to imbue my body or my shell with emotions. And right now, this is Paul Ekman's model of seven different facial, um, universal facial expressions, also called the facial action coding system. We have all of these, but I think that emotions are too discretized. Emotions are not linear, they're not binary. I can go from being mad to happy within the split of a second, some people won't, but <laughs> that's me. I'm a Pisces, I said it on the first slide. <laughs> and so what I did is, this is a workshop that I gave at uh, Unity in San Francisco uh, when I worked there, is I kind of saw the metaphor of emotions as fluidic, because the very word emotion means energy and motion. So what I'm doing now is I'm trying to create general intelligence models that actually use fluid dynamics to explain what emotions are, because I think a lot of people haven't been looking into emotion in particular, and so that's an area I'm aiming to explore next. And so, ultimately, what I want to do, which I feel hasn't been done as well as it could have, is to just understand that when I'm creating, that creating is the ultimate form of the exaltation of my life, and I can create myself because I'm a very cheap model to use. <laughs> my mirror's right there. I could use others. But ultimately, the reason why I create is because I want to understand who I am, what am I, and where, do, where am I going, and where do I come from, which is a very famous painting by Paul Gauguin. And ultimately, me, just like all of you, we're a combination of our experiences, our trials and tribulations, but you know, sometimes we need to just sit back and look at ourselves and empathize with ourselves. And so in looking at gaming technologies and virtual reality, as a vehicle for empathy. It's helped me not only empathize more with myself, my physicality, the way that I process information, but it's also helped me to empathize with others as well. And so I hope that in the future people look for towards AI, not as something cynical, but not also tending towards technological determinism, but just looking at it as it is. That's it. <laughs>